All right. Thank you, folks, for coming out tonight. This is Glendon Cameron, and we're going to have a storage auction webinar. It's going to be a little different, but it uh, should be really cool. So let's pull that up. All right. This is how it goes. I will go ahead and give the webinar and you can ask questions like if something pops in your head, you can go ahead and ask it while I'm giving the webinar, but I'm not going to answer until I finish. And with that, let's get to rocking. Hey, this is Glendon Cameron. Welcome to the Journey to Storage Auction Success webinar session number one. I'm going to jump into this. It's a little different. Over the years, there's consistently same questions that I get. And then I'm going to start off by answering a few. But before we get into that, the scope of this webinar is to make you a successful storage auction buyer going forward. Success is you win far more than you lose. And I will say that there will be times that you will lose when you buy units. There's no such thing as I never lost money on the unit. So anyone tells you that they're lying. Just straight up, they're lying. Uh, to dispel myths and TV hype and to direct mindsets. This is something that you will not see in any other storage auction training. Set an income goal. This is where most people go wrong. They like, oh, I want to go buy some units. And they go out there and they buy something and they hope to make money. They're not planning on making money. If you want to make $30,000 a year, write it on your goal sheet. If you want to make $50,000 a year, write it on your goal sheet. If you want to make $100,000 a year, write it on your goal sheet. If you expect to be paid, you will be paid. When I first got into business, this guy told me, and I told this, I said this in a video many times. He's like, uh, don't set your heart on making a full-time income in the storage auction business. And when he said it, I immediately respond, well, that's my intention. And if you remember the Hustle and Mindset Project, you know the power of intention and the power of actually having the courage to dare. And that's exactly what happened over a period of months and years. We got to livable income in about 18 months, actually before that. So understand, then volume is a part of this thing because if you're buying units you're gonna get so much stuff and that scares people we're gonna get too much stuff we're gonna get covered you have to learn how to deal with the volume because the more you buy the luckier you become and the cherry picking thing is nice in theory but I know from you know experience that you have to have an infrastructure you have to have a setup and the more you buy like I said the more you buy the luckier you become Money never sleeps. By the end of this webinar, you're going to learn how to be making money seven days a week because there are certain things that you can do to ensure that money's always coming in. You have to leverage your time through the Internet and other tools that are available. So as you are sitting back and preparing for this, set a high goal. You know, don't say, like, hey, I want to make an extra 200 bucks a month. No, that's not high enough. Try 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. That's going to get your juices running. Setting an income goal is nearly half the battle because it gives you direction. Brian Tracy said, and I don't know where he got it from, but just the fact of writing down your goals increase the likelihood that it happens a thousand percent. Just writing it down. That's how powerful writing down your goals is. This is a big one. Big one. I've heard it. I've had this question maybe a thousand times on last. How do you profile units? Is it worth profiling units? I'm going to break it down so it's forever broken down. This can be useful to a degree, but it can be a huge waste of time. And what I'm going to do Let's pop out of here because I set this up and it's, it's going to be here. I'll show you what this is. This is what I used to use. They've changed it quite a bit. This is the daily report where probably 
60% of the storage auctions in town are listed here. Here's one that was listed yesterday, 916. And so let's go through this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Okay. There's a few things that stand out at this ad. This is a lot of freaking units. And Chanika Dawson, Tyler. I don't know what they're tight. This is so this this is what I used to do. I'll show you. I would you know I've already highlighted that. So I went and checked out the neighborhood. And it's in the hood. <laughs> when you see a place that doesn't that has auctions pretty regularly, like I don't know if this is their quarterly sale or if there's a monthly sale. But based on this area, and it's so sad because when I first arrived in Atlanta, this was an upscale neighborhood. It is now the hood. It is just, there's a few nice houses over there, but it's just totally surrounded by the hood. So this is the spot and it's a U-Haul. So you can expect roaches, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. But this is the spot and we're going to go back here. So even with this, half are going to be gone. And, you know, I went through all of this and I counted out the names. You know, this person, you might be able to research. Is it going to be worth it? Who knows? Common names are ridiculously hard to research. Crazy, crazy hard. So you, you saw that. So and we can go back. And I can pull up another one. Uh, let's see. Extra space. Oh, I know this property very well. Notice the difference? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, this spot's about 10 miles from my current location. It's in a it's on the edge of a very wealthy neighborhood. And I can guarantee you, let's go to this again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They're gonna have three or four or two. It was like when we would go to this spot, and it used to be called the storage spot. Um, it, we were amazed if they had six or nine because you know usually the manager there. Now they could. Now I will say for full disclosure, they possibly could have all of these units. But once again, look at these names. This one <clears throat> you could probably profile, but it could be a closet unit. You have no clue. So let's go back. And I'm doing this for a reason. So you have this, this, this. Let's click on this. All right. Hit that. Let's see. Let's click on this one. Now, once, now <laughs> when you see this many units, it's usually in the hood. And Lake Extra Space, Lakewood Avenue. This is relatively... Uh, that's an East Point. We'll go to our friend. Google is our friend. Google is our good friend. Throw that in, throw that in there. Yep, that's actually not too far. I used to live in that neighborhood about 15 years ago. It's a trip. It's a total trip. Okay, so we know it's in the hood. We have a lot of units. Now, look at these names. Once again, I'm doing this for a reason. I'm not wasting your time. I'm doing this for a reason. So to profile units, you have to go through all of this stuff. Hold on. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? If you're profiling units, and this is a land, and granted, there's a lot of auctions, but... You could literally do the groundwork on a few hundred units and come up with nothing. So that's what's uh, to show you. Over half of the units will not go for auction. If you're part-time and you have loads of time, 
sure, go for it. I never did it. And the reason is, if it was a unit worth profiling, nine times out of ten, everyone profiled it. If there was a name of a famous person that came up in the auction listing, you knew by the number of people at that auction. At that time, those auctions would look like storage wars crowds because you go to a place like, say, Ansley, and there was normally four to eight of us that would show up. You go down there, and it's like 80 people, folks hanging off the fence. They know some famous person's unit is coming up, and someone did like a Channel 13 and broadcasted it all over the place. So you have all these new people, don't know what they're doing, trying to get this unit. Some have brought a lot of money, and unless the unit is like spectacular, you could get it and wish you hadn't got it. I know people, I know a guy got all this Nixon's unit. Uh, actually, I was part of that. Um, Tony Braxton had some shit go up. Dion Ferris. Actually, her shit never went up. Um, this Falcon, I can't remember his name. And I'm telling you from buying those units, being part of it, the stuff wasn't that great. Most of my really good units came from people that you didn't fucking know about. Like the unit I got in Conyers with the gold Cougar Rands, the guy was a developer. But if I had profiled the unit, I wouldn't have came up with that information because the unit was in the name of his kids. Profiling units is a waste of time if you are a volume buyer. See, it's a different game. Uh, it, it makes great for great television and people like, yeah, we, we profile some units, but I just showed you what you had to go through to properly profile all the units. So you're going to do the that could take weeks going through that list, checking each name to see if it's something that you could Google. And maybe you do find somebody that's juicy, but you just have the name. It may not be that person's stuff. And if it is that person's stuff, they could come in five minutes or shoot just before you go behind the gates and pay. Profiling units, unless you're in a small town or you have a lot of time, is usually a waste of time. Just telling you from experience. It's just a waste of time. Now, this is a big one. A lot of people are asking about this because many people live in apartments. How do you work out of a unit? Simple formula. You sell the big stuff first. You know, some of this stuff I've had to change up because the game has changed. You sell the big stuff. Like if you buy a household unit, it has a refrigerator, dining room table, stuff like that. You get that out. And you may have to rent another unit. I know it's like, what? More money yet? Because you can't display that stuff in the unit that it's in. You won't display it well. If you can't display it well, you can't sell it. Either rent that unit or pull that furniture out, take it somewhere where it can be displayed and sell it. And then work on the smalls later. Because the way things are going now, if you're working in a unit, you're under a timeline. If you weren't working on a unit, you want to get out of that unit within 28 you know, or less days. 28, you know, because most months have uh, 30 days, but you don't want to push it. You want to be out that unit or maybe on the 30th day before you have to shut it down is throw the stuff in your truck or car and be gone. So you're under a lot of time constraints. But sell the big stuff first. Process the smalls later. If you can move the smalls out the unit to wherever you do your eBay, Amazon stuff, maybe. Because the thing is, it's really hard to say, hey, you should do this when I don't know your capabilities. Because I've had people ask me serious questions they ain't even on the car. They can't even move, they can't move their they can't move their thoughts. They don't have a car. So understand, inventory is not a dirty word. Having five, six, seven units rented with stuff that can make money. Let's be very clear about that. Not just having five or six units rented and you don't know what the hell is in there, but having five or six units with good sellable stuff that you know will make you money and you've got enough stuff stacked in the units. And I, I will explain that. Say your unit is 200 bucks a month. You want to have 1500 to $3,000 worth of stuff in that unit. So you can sell a few pieces and pay the rent or whatever. You don't want to have a unit that's worth, you know, you're paying 200 bucks for rent. And you only got $400 worth of stuff in there. You don't want to do that unless it's like your display unit where you're constantly putting stuff in there. Like you just have it kind of half empty so people can look at it. 
That's one thing, but that's part of a plan. That's part of a process. But you you have to, it's like the flea market booths. You see this frequently. Someone's paying 300 bucks a month for a flea market booth. And if you add everything up in the booth, it doesn't come up to 300 bucks. And they wonder why they're struggling. So you will have to stack your unit with the appropriate stuff. Now, this is something else that we used to do, and it can be very helpful when you're dealing with a lot of volume. Go to the dollar store and get those garage sale stickers and make sure you get color coded. Like they give you purple, blue, green, or if you buy yellow, then if you need, you know, make sure that you have a lot of stickers of different colors. So before you apply the stickers, whatever day you bought that unit, write that date in the sticker, in the circle, the square, whatever you have, and put it on stuff. Like if you have a bunch of clothes, put them in the bag and put a sticker on the bag. Do not sticker every piece of clothing. Or if you have a bunch of boxes, stack them somewhere and put a sticker that's prominent and keep the boxes together. Because this will visually cue in that, oh, this orange sticker represents that I bought this stuff in June. It's August. It's not moving. I haven't processed. I need to focus on that because I've had it for a while and it's cost me money. So the sticker system, the inventory system, is a very down and dirty and a very cheap way for you to kind of gauge where you are. Because if you got a unit and you're putting stuff in, you're taking stuff out, you have orange stickers and red stickers and blue stickers, you're just like, wait a minute, I've got many months of stuff in here. I need to really look at the stuff. So you go to your spreadsheet and it's like, Orange stickers for June, red stickers for August, blue stickers for May, something like that. And then you can like, okay, I've had this stuff 90 days. It's time to either blow it out. If you haven't put it into your pipeline, maybe you don't have to blow it out. You have to do your research on it. But staying on top of your inventory is one of the biggest and most challenging things that you will do. Wholesale ratios. Now, this is a sneaky little tactic. I have bought units because I've only wanted one thing. Just one. But I wanted it bad. So I would get my one thing. And sometimes I would sell units. But it wasn't for auction. It was for the other auction buyers. Like I bought a unit that had a player piano in it. And I knew someone that was looking for it. And I, that's the only thing I wanted out of the unit. There was other bunch of crappy stuff. I researched it. It was the unit cost 300 bucks. The stuff other than the player piano, the player piano, I got 900 bucks for. But the other stuff may have added up to 1500 bucks. Not a bad unit, but it wasn't my kind of stuff and I didn't want to mess with it. So I paid 300 bucks for it. I knew I made 900 already. So I was at a profit of 600 bucks within a few days. So I took some crap I didn't want out of my warehouse, put it in the unit, and jammed that sucker up. The stuff that I took out of the warehouse was what I called free and clear. Free and clear stuff was if I bought a unit for 500 bucks and I was at the 2000 or the $3,000 profit margin, I could literally give that stuff away and not lose a penny. So that's what I mean by free and clear. So I would put this free and clear stuff in. Some was good stuff. Some of it, you know, and I was like, hey, I bought this unit. This is what's in it. And they would come in and... I knew I only wanted 350 bucks, $300 to bring me back to an even profit of 900 and 50 for the gas and labor. So I would start, I was like, well, and because they knew what to pay for it. That was another problem. I was like, I'll sell it to you for, you know, I started at 800, 1000, right? Because they could conceivably triple their money with the stuff I put in there. And they're like, oh no, I don't know, I don't know. Well, what if I gave you 700? And I was like, 720. Ah, no, nah, man, 700. All right. <laughs> you see how that works? If you're thinking about just trying to sell it the way it is, yeah, you run into some problems. But this is what, you know, going back to the other slide, that inventory is not a dirty word. If you have free and clear inventory, you can pull that inventory, throw it into a unit and flip it and still be on the plus side. Seriously, because this is one of the things that you learn is. You have to adapt to your environment. That's one of the reasons that I was able to buy so many units and not really kill myself all the time. There were some months I moved everything I bought. Uh, there was months that I flipped 10%. There was months I flipped 25%. It just really depend on what was going on. And this is why 
you kind of have to know who the players are. You have to know who sells what. You have to know where they sell. And what I mean by that, if a person is selling in the flea market, he's at a disadvantage to a person who sells in the store. If you're on the store, you can damn near get double what the person at the flea market can get for the same exact item. So this is one of the reasons that you know I stress getting a warehouse because if um, you don't have the space, then you're under those constraints of I got to roll this stuff out. And the customer, the end user today is extremely savvy. They can smell desperation and fear and take full advantage of it. But with that plan that I said of solving the unit, you know, actually putting good stuff in there, because this is the thing. When you buy a lot of units, you get stuff that you may not be able to sell really quickly, but it does have value. And that value is worth something to someone else. And also, you know, when you buy a unit and you're doing this, this was back in the glory days where sometimes they gave us a week to clean out a unit or they gave us 72 hours. And I would do all this in 72 hours, you know, pull out what I wanted, come back, salt the unit, get the buyer out there. You got to roll. Because another thing is, is you never know how the money situation of your posse may be. So the best time to hit them is like the day of the auction or the day after. Now, this goes back to selling out of the unit. Craigslist and your list. Big stuff first. And if you don't have a list, you are in trouble. I am going to spank you. If you are not building an email list or a customer list, you're, it's a grave mistake. It is, it is, it's just shooting yourself in the foot. You have to collect this information because you get this unit and there's this nice stuff you can sell on Craigslist. And if you had a list, and I'm speaking from experience, you had a list of 250 names, not 10,000, not 5,000 but 250 names of people who have bought stuff from you, like you, you can buy a unit, put stuff on Craigslist, and then get home that night and it's like, look, hey, I bought this storage unit. You can go ahead and say you bought the unit. Now, the, the cat is out the bag. Anyone that's consistently coming up with a bunch of used stuff, people are pretty much going to figure it out now because of the television shows. I got the stuff out of the unit today. I want to share this with you. And you shoot out your email blast. You'll make sales that night if you have the stuff and then push it a little further. Ask them to forward this email to someone. If they don't see anything they like, their, their girlfriend may like it or, you know, Perry the parrot might like it. This is how you this is how you grow your business. When we started with the upscale garage sale, first few weekends were kind of brutal. But a year later and we had a huge customer list. I remember it was a cold day in November. It was cold. It was rainy. I had bought some nice units. There was some nice auctions coming up on Monday. And I was kind of low on cash. And then I was like, God, well, I could pull it off the credit card or I could take it out the bank. Because sometimes your, your business will eat up all your operating capital. And then if you don't have a lot of credit or something, then you're kind of like, like Willy Wobo. So... I forced myself to come up with a solution. So I went to our list. And once again, going back to those stickers, I knew stuff that we had in the warehouse that we had in there six months. So I took, I spent that cold, well, it was cold, so I wasn't really sweating. And I moved everything to one area that had been there for a long time. This was stuff that was free and clear. It was just taking up space. So I made crazy mad deals. You know, things like I had a bedroom set I normally would have asked uh, 500 bucks for 250, you know, or make me an offer. And I sent it to my list. And on this cold day in November, the parking lot was full. I made about $7,000 that day. That is the power of having your list. And it took a while to build. I'm not going to say, oh, this is going to happen overnight. But you want to build a quality list. You want to build a list of people who buy stuff from you, people in your community, if you do a Facebook group, you want to keep it as local as possible. Uh, one of the reasons I backed away from Resellology was most of my strong supporters were like all over the country. And it wasn't a lot of people local, which made you know some of the stuff I was coming across, it was really challenging to sell. I actually went home to see my mom and ended up taking uh, literally an SUV full of stuff 
to a few people in Birmingham who saw my stuff. And I was like, well, well, next time I come down, I bring it. And that trip I made about like, you know, 900 bucks. So it was nice, but I don't want to be driving to Birmingham like every two weeks. So I kind of like backed up from that. But just to tell you, your customer list is huge. It is huge. It is so huge because once you get a substantial customer list, because with storage auctions, you're always getting stuff that people need and big sellers, sheets, towels, dishes, flatware, baby clothes, shoes, kids, clothes for kids. You're going to get that stuff in space and you can flip it extra cheap to your list because in the upscale garage that we had in there, 4,000 square feet, everything was a dollar. And we used to have garbage bags on the desk because people would go to the dollar section and get 100 pieces and say, hey, I got 100 pieces. What about 50 cents a piece? OK, give me the 50 stuff that we would have thrown away or they would go in there. And this one guy got slick. He said, can I get everything I can stuff in that trash bag? And they were like contractor trash bags. I mean, dude was stepping on it. He was in the bag. He was doing all kinds of stuff. And he got that bag full, could barely close it. He had to put it on a dolly. <laughs> he said a hundred dollars for everything in this bag. I was like, sure. I watched him and I didn't care because everything that he touched was from the dollar section. He came back with friends I made about 300 bucks off of him. So you, it's really about how you look at your business, because what you you know, I haven't watched an episode of the TV shows this year. Uh, since wow, going on, I haven't watched any of that stuff since October. Yeah, going on a year because it, it just didn't make any sense for me, and I knew what it was. You know how I feel about it. So the, they don't they they help me. I have to be just a hundred percent honest. I made way more money from my information products because of the shows. So it, it's a really strange relationship I have with them, but. Those shows do not really teach you how to build a robust sales resale business. They don't. They don't even get close. So with, you know, selling on Craigslist in your list, throw stuff on Craigslist. And, you know, even if your list only has 10 people, that's a start. But your list will kill them. It will blow Craigslist away. Now. We talked about the furniture, the big stuff. Say you only have small stuff in this unit. This is the new paradigm. And I'm going to really talk about eBay and whew, eBay. I, I really, I really wish I can just say don't mess with eBay at all, but that would not be good for you. And that would be doing you a disservice. Just say, you know, eBay is something I begrudgingly recommend. It's a necessary evil on some items. But Amazon is really uh, providing them some serious uh, comp. So what you do, if you don't have an Amazon account, you create one. Anything that can go on Amazon. And you have to look because it's expanded. You can sell all kinds of stuff. And if you get a unit full of new stuff, if it's Amazon worthy, what you do is you send it to Amazon FBA. So you will have to get your Amazon account, your Amazon FBA account. And then eBay for obvious reasons. That's your stack with your smalls. Another way is message boards and forums. If you get collectibles, there is, it's, it's all a matter of research because I could spend the next three months saying, go buy this item. Go buy this uh, McCoy pottery. Go, And you may never see that stuff ever. So you're better off saying, OK, buying a unit, then doing your research, because when you do your research, you get you also buy your education. When you research and look this stuff up, you remember it. So the next time you see it, you don't have to look it up or, you know, where to look immediately. So there's a lot of benefits to buy. But with your smalls, you know, Amazon stuff first, Amazon FBA, then eBay. Uh, actually put eBay at the tail of your retail business. Now, this is something I've been preaching, 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 preaching. Your money will be limited by your infrastructure, not by how much money you have in your pocket, not how many auctions you go to, but it will be limited by your infrastructure. I've said it before. I'll say it again. If you're serious about being successful in this business, you need a warehouse. 
It may not be a 10,000, 5,000 square foot warehouse like we had. It may be 1,000 square feet, it may be 1,500. You can do a lot with 1,500. You need some space to operate. I mean, you know, make do with your house, make do with storage units, but at some point you need to upgrade to a warehouse if you're serious. You'll need a V8 truck and covered trailer. I know people can pull stuff with a V6, and if you're pulling heavy loads consistently with a V6 and it wasn't designed for that, you're going to mess up your transmission. Just letting you know what's going to happen. You're going to go up a hill one day and you're going to start sl 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 slipping away because it wasn't designed for that. And I've seen people moving trailers that were way too heavy for that truck. But, you know, people do their thing. A uh, box truck is best. At some point, you will have to hire help. I know everyone's like, I don't want to have help. I don't want to have employees. If you're growing so fast that you need help, that's a good sign for your business. Because growth is the order of the day. If you're not growing, you're dying. And when, when, when I say infrastructure, I am talking about the equipment and the setup and the things that you need for your business to be successful. Because say you're working out of your house and you've reached a saturation point. All your rooms are full. You have two car garage, it's full. You have a basement, it's full. You have another problem. You have no separation between work and home life. You're always at work. You're all, I mean, it, it can be overwhelming at times. And a lot of people go through with this. So having a warehouse that's away from the house actually gives you your house back, which for as uh, there's recently people are starting to wake up and see this. And it, it's, it's a big, big deal. All right. So that is that session. There will be three more. And what I'm going to do is open up the floor to questions. You can ask any question you want. And if you think of it and you're in the Facebook group, you can ask a question there. <laughs> All right, Kyle, that's that's a different kind of a response. I haven't seen that. Well, Essentially, this will be made available in uh, Hustler University sometime tomorrow after I process it and edit it and do the things I need to do to it. So you really won't miss that. You're at the question phase. What is the best way to get rid of dollar items? I had oh, 4,000 square feet. Everything was a dollar. Um, part of that, I, part of that is depends on what the dollar item is, how frequently you get it. But the short answer, you need a flea market or you need to create your own flea market. You know, eBay, Amazon, that's just a waste of time and money. Or you can wholesale it to other flea market people. Like say, say you got you bought 10 units for the month and you've got like maybe $2,000 worth of dollar stuff. But you don't want to mess with it. So you, you go through your network and say, look, I got $3,000 worth of dollar stuff. I'll sell it to the first person that shows you who can haul it away for 600 500 bucks. You can do that, too. Uh, this is from Steven. Would you use shelves in the unit you're using as a warehouse? Yes. Gives you more max space. And on the shelving thing. I you can over time you will amass enough stuff that will make shelves. A uh, chick a cheap and dirty way to make shelves is to go to Home Depot, get some four by sixes, and you, if you see a unit that has paint buckets in it, full or empty doesn't matter. Buy it because you can get them cheap. And what you can do is take the paint buckets and put them on the floor, take the wood, and just stack the paint buckets and with. Uh, a plank between each one against the wall and you can create some real cheap and easy shells that break down really quick. Now your big problem is when you don't want the paint anymore, you have to pay to get that stuff thrown away. You just can't toss that anywhere, but that's a cheap way to make a lot of shells. Or if you want to spend money, you can do the same thing with uh, like pails or buckets. You know, if you can get them cheap enough, go to the dollar store, gets like some pails, turn them over and you can create shells that way. 
can't put anything super heavy on them like you can with the paint buckets, but you can make use of them. This is from Kyle. Do you ever bring storage unit contents to auction houses to sell after you sort it? Let me tell you my experience with auction houses. There's a group of storage auction people that love auction houses. There's a group of people such as myself who hate them. You have to go and see if it's your thing. This is, I'll give you the good. The good thing about an auction house, if you, t if you know, typically this is how it's going to work. You just, you show up and sometimes they will say, hey, you're going to be seven or you're going to be 12. And there's other times you have to get there early and do what's called buy your spot. Like the number one spot may go for 300 bucks. No, number two spot may go for 250. And the deal is the people in the first one through five or, you know, however big the auction is, or one through 20 do better because they hit the crowd when they still have money. So you want to go in the earlier rounds. But you will blow out stuff really quick. It's like if you run 200 items through, you run 300 items through, you make, you know, two to six or seven thousand dollars real quick. But you can see items that you know you could sell for 500 bucks on the street go for 100 bucks because it's an auction and it's only one person there that wants that. It's really risky. <clears throat> and I did it about 12 times. And there was only three times I was really happy. <laughs> the other nine times I was pissed and I didn't go back anymore. But there are people who buy units strictly for auction houses. Like they can come to Atlanta and get in for 300 bucks, spend 100 bucks in gas, truck it back up to wherever the hell they are, and they run through the auction that weekend and make 1,800 bucks. You know, it, 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 it depends on where you are, your clientele, what you're selling, how much you got it for. But typically, the people that loved auction houses were the folks who lived 45 minutes to an hour outside of Atlanta. I looked for an auction house in town. And the ones I found, they weren't they weren't spectacular either. They were great to buy from, but actually sell, they sucked. So you, you got to do some uh, experimentation there. Uh, let's see. This was with Steven. We have Square. Do we still need to buy a cash register for a flea market booth? You need a way to account for your money. Um, you can get by with a cash box that has the little dividers for the cash and your square. That's all you need. I would not buy a cash register. I would not spend the money on a cash register in 2013. Nope. Square and cash, you're good to go. Let's see. Any more questions? I'll hold on a second because they were rolling through for pretty hard there. Uh, this is from Kyle. Partnership of our employees. Employees. Uh, I'm going to go a little in depth in that because I see a lot of that in groups where people want to hire someone and pay them a percentage. The people who are drawn to a percentage typically don't make good employees there's usually someone like yourself and it just unless you have enough um volume where you can put some nice spiff out like if they list you know 500 items in the month they get a two 400 500 dollar bonus yeah that may work but don't pay equity for dollar work uh, just hire someone and pay them per hour for most things if you're going to have a partner, they need to be a full-fledged partner. I mean, sharing in the pain as well as the profits. Um... Uh, Do we really have to have all flea market items on Craigslist, even $5 items? Uh, no. I don't know. I don't know where you got that from. No, I wouldn't. Only way I would sell flea market items on Craigslist as uh, bulk lots. No, no. Do not list that stuff on Craigslist. It, it, for one, 
unless it's just unless it's something that's mispriced, it's not going to sell. And the amount of work is incredible. Uh, your account will get limited or ghosted because of the volume. No, no, no. If you give you an example, say you buy a unit and there's what's called uh, Main Street. That's a Walmart brand. But the stuff is clean and serviceable. But it's not going on eBay. It's not going on Amazon. You can't actually you have to be a approved clothing vendor to sell clothes on Amazon. So you've got like 400 pieces. What you do is you put them together, make sure they're super clean and you sell it as a bulk lot, 25, 30, 40, 50 bucks, whatever. That's what you do with that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you take flea market stuff to the flea market or you have a garage sale and blow it out or you wholesale it to other resellers. Not on Craigslist. I need help find a person to help me list item. No one here wants to work. That's Kyle. Uh, it's hard. I went through to get people to outsource my eBay. I probably talked to 20 people to get four. Uh, you're right. They don't want to work. It's it's. I had now I don't I haven't done this, uh, but someone told me that they had good success with getting a virtual employee. And this is how they did it. They had one ink frog. It was one of those auction platforms and the virtual assistant who was in the Philippines listed the stuff in the system and they just kind of went and checked them. And then they actually did the listing on eBay. Essentially, they filled up the pipeline. I can't really give you some serious guidelines on that because my partner did a lot of listing and we had some people working for us, but my partner was like there on top of them. And then we just got sick of eBay. 2006, we, we got sick of eBay and that's when I outsourced everything. eBay is a very challenging thing. Um, I had to brainstorm on that. I'll do this. Tomorrow, tonight, take a sheet of paper and put, how can I get someone to help me list this stuff? And just, because you, wherever you are, you, you're going to have to think of something unique. It's got to be some kind of spiff or something. <clears throat> but just think about it because this is something I have done frequently. Like if I need some high quality work done, I'll find a recent college graduate or someone in college who's desperate for money. Awesome awesome uh, effort I get frequently because they're broke. Oh, the garage sale book. Now, what was the context of that? Because I don't think I said list each and single item. I think I meant list them in bulk or actually advertise that you're having a sale. But I will have to look at that. Uh, this is Kyle. It's so easy to sell a hundred dollar ounce, but make real money. You need to be able to sell a junk that's under five bucks. This is very true. That's why we went to the ultimate garage sale because it was frustrating. Um, I hated the flea market because the flea market's here. You have to get up at four thirty or earlier on Saturday, which means your truck hat, you know, get up and be on the way and be at the gate before six. Because if you come 6.30, you can still get a decent spot. You come after that, you're way in the back, and you just don't do as well. I hated it. Totally hated it. So I, I do feel, I remember feeling your pain, and like I said, use the um, you know Earl Nightingale method. Sit down, write your problem at the top of a sheet of paper, and answer, you know, come up with 20 different answers on how to solve that problem, because See, so yeah, where you are, you may have resources someone else, but yeah, I can't. That's a hard one because you have a few problems when you trust someone to list your stuff. If you trust them to list your stuff on eBay, if they do something wrong, it's your ass. And Craigslist, it's not so punitive, but eBay or Amazon, eBay is a one shot pony and Amazon is more so. You mess up with Amazon, that's it. You can never. Get an account with them again. They just do it to you. So that's a hard one. Okay. Any more questions? I'll wait a second.
Now, there will be some more sessions of this. So if you don't have anything or, you know, after the minute I shut it down, you're like, ah, there was another question. We'll be here 8 p.m. Thursday night, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. I will put that uh, link out in the Hustle University and send that out. So there's going to be more because I'm going to talk about different things. And this session will be available in Hustle University tomorrow, probably tomorrow afternoon. Because I gotta cut it, I gotta cut it, edit it, and do some things to it. No problem. Oh, okay. Stevens is like, I just opened up my doors and I'm at the flea market. <laughs> yeah, there's some places like that. Um, but I mean, just as a personal preference, I really hated flea markets. I like going to them to look around now, but selling, I hated it. I totally hated it. Um, once I get some things straightened up, I'm actually going to start a meetup group in Atlanta, but it's going to be more toward business people, entrepreneurs, things like that. It won't be storage auction stuff because I was going to do that, but I've always talked about more things. And yeah, there, there's definitely a meetup coming. It's just I need to straighten out everything that I have on my plate right now before I add something else. But that's definitely on the uh, development plan. Because I did a few events and I enjoyed them and it, they would be fun. So that is something that's coming. If there are no more questions, I will shut it down. And once again, if you're Hustle University, uh, this will be available. And for those who just signed up, I'll send you a link where if you want to buy the recorded version, you can. And that is that. Because let's see, I'm going to hate wait one more second. And that's it. I think everyone had the question. Once again, Thursday night again. And then there's two more sessions next week with some more information. I want to say thanks for everyone that came out sharing your evening with me. And uh, I'll see you on the good side.